What is the condition of free speech in America today? I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. On this video series, Speaking Freely, we're talking with thought leaders and major players in the free speech drama unfolding in America. This time, I'm speaking with Catherine J. Ross, a First Amendment expert and professor at the George Washington University School of Law. Catherine Ross, you uh, took a slightly unconventional approach toward a legal career and a career as a law professor, and I just wonder how much that has uh, informed the work that you've subsequently done. That's really insightful of you, Sandy. It's informed it a lot. I think one of the reasons that I became interested in the speech rights of young people was that I began my career as a social and political historian and I did work on the needs of children um, in the emergence of post-Civil War America. Um, at that time, largely their family and poverty needs, but then I transitioned from history to social policy and um, child development issues for children, and I was looking at a wide range of issues about children from very young ages through high school. And I did all of that before becoming a lawyer. And I became a lawyer in part because I realized that a lot of my work as a scholar of children and their needs um, was really about the struggle of apportioning rights and the conflict among rights uh, between parents and guardians of children, children themselves, and the modern state, which has a profound interest in the next generation of citizens, or at least should have right. that kind of interest. And so as a lawyer, when I was thinking about First Amendment issues, I was perhaps more acutely aware of the rights that young people have to express their own views sure. and the fact that they have views. Well, when we think about children's rights, we think more about the right not to be abused, mm -hmm. uh, to have nourishment, clothing, shelter, very, very basic rights for children. But you're really, you have advanced the proposition that children have quite sophisticated rights that we have to worry about. Uh, I must say not very many First Amendment scholars talk about the free speech rights of children. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, so my, in my earlier work as a social policy analyst based on my historical research, I was concerned about those rights that are the rights to be taken care of yes. that most lawyers think about. Uh, my first book was an edited volume on child abuse and neglect, an interdisciplinary study. I did a lot of work on poverty. Um, but then when you look at that, you also realize that children have things to say about the arrangements that are made for them. So our societal response to child abuse is generally to remove children from their parents. Yes. Even though ab abused children often love their parents sure. and they don't want to be removed. And so we need to also think about whether there are ways to keep them safe. And so that was part of what helped me form my understanding that even young children have ways of communicating to us what they prefer and what they need. That doesn't mean they get to make all the decisions. I, I was just going to ask you, are, are they wise enough to know what's best for themselves? Not always. But they feel better about the decisions that are made on their behalf if they think that someone listened to them. So I had a very un unusual opportunity. I was on the faculty of the Yale Child Study Center, which is part of the Yale Medical School. Yes. And I worked with an interdisciplinary team, largely child psychiatrists, but also uh, very sophisticated social workers. 
and I worked on a team that was looking at contested custody cases, um, not just about um, abused children, but also what we call high-conflict divorces. And I learned how people who are skilled in the psychological arts can elicit a lot of information, even from children who are too young to really be articulate, mm -hmm. by um, sophisticated analysis of their drawings, of their play, and um, obviously we don't allow them to make the decisions, but it helps us understand, um, it, it helps them feel listened to, as I said earlier, but it also helps us understand how to make a decision more palatable to them by taking into account some of what they feel strongly about. And that is part of what made me think about the right young people have under the Constitution to speak their mind and to form their views and that their views are not always the same as their parents' views. Their rights are not contingent on their parents, although, in fact, when you study the, the legal cases about children's speech rights, very few kids make it to court without their parents' support. Sure. Uh, how would you define the ongoing abridgment of children's free speech rights? Okay. Well, I have to start with what the rights are. Sure. And they have rights in school, which is their primary contact with the government. We have to remember that the right to free speech is only between the individual and the government. Of course. A child doesn't have the right to say whatever they want to their parents. They're not the government. Or to, you know, there right. are many settings in which none of us have Well, their parents are authority right. figures who, who can... Who can send them to bed early uh, and without right. dinner. Right. As I had to explain to my son, who kept saying, you know, when he was young, but you write about children's rights. Why do I have to? You know, different story. Um, so in school, which is uh, primary contact with the government, um, students have a right to say what they want so long as they do not disrupt the ongoing work of the school, which is education. And the Supreme Court held that, you know, more than 40 years ago. And then there are some exceptions to that for specific kinds of students. What kinds speech. of exceptions are there? Um, if the school is understood to be sponsoring the speech and having approved it, let's say, in the school newspaper, then they can censor for any legitimate pedagogical reason. Students are not allowed to advocate substance abuse unless it's a political statement like right. legalized drugs now. Those are the main ones. But I'd also say that even before that decision, which is Tinker versus Des Moines that's, right. that some of your listeners might be aware of, back in the 1940s in a case involving Jehovah's Witnesses who didn't want to salute the flag that has West been Virginia much... West Virginia Board of Education versus, versus Barnett. Barnett. Excellent. It's been much in the news because we're speaking in the middle of the whole NFL That's right. kneeling controversy. Uh, the court said people, including school children, have the right not to participate in patriotic exercises to express their own views, philosophies. Right. They can have many different reasons for doing this. And they said, in fact, that there is nowhere where it's more important to show that what we say about rights is not mere platitudes, but that we really mean it. We have to teach that to the next generation. And so we can't dismiss and say, oh, these are just elementary school children who didn't want right. to do this. Right. This is for everybody. Right. And Tinker v. Des Moines was... Uh an empowering decision for the political views. I think high school students at that time. Maybe well, there were some younger. The youngest members. was in elementary school, oh, but really? he wasn't actually a party to the case. Right. But junior high and and just for our viewers, uh, the Tinker children were wearing black armbands to symbolize their opposition to the war in Vietnam. Yes, and they were doing it as part of a national uh, Christmas time demonstration that was actually calling for cessation of hostilities during the holiday period that was right. organized by right. Senator Robert Kennedy. And that case was decided in 1969, if I'm not mistaken, yes. Tinker v. Des Moines. Very important breakthrough in terms of symbolic speech rights. Exactly. And let me explain people. what symbolic sure. speech is. 
uh, because um, they were wearing armbands. They were not articulating with words, written or spoken. And symbolic speech means if, if you have an idea that you're trying to get across through a symbol, which might be kneeling or wearing a black armband, and the people who see your symbol will understand what you are saying, then that is speech just as surely as if you used words, and it has all the protections of the First Amendment. And it was the school board in that case, the school district saw it as disruptive. Well, and that the, was why they it, tried to it, punish them. It was even worse. They didn't claim that there was any disruption. After the fact, when they looked at some of the legal principles <laughs> from other lower court cases, right. they said, oh, um, there was a student from our school who died in Vietnam, and some mm -hmm. of his friends might have been really upset. So we wanted to protect them. And it turned out, in fact, that didn't happen, right. even though the speech went forward. But there was actual viewpoint censorship, which is one of the worst things under the First Amendment, right. because while the school allowed all sorts of symbols to be worn, including the Iron Cross, which was a symbol that the Nazis used, um, they made a special rule when they heard that the Tinkers and some other young people were planning to wear black armbands, and they said, no black armbands. They made that rule a week before the protest was supposed to start. Right. And then they said, you have to go home, you can't come back to school until you take the armbands off. Vietnam era, there were a lot of uh, sensitivities that ended up having to be dealt with in court, I think, of the Pentagon Papers case. And, Which you wrote and, about so and eloquently. Daniel Ellsberg uh, breaking through the, the sort of silence. So in some ways, this is a legacy of the Vietnam era, this concern about children's rights. Is that right? Well, I think about speech rights and the rights of dissidents. That's right. Because the, the First Amendment is for the dissident. Sure. The speaker who everyone agrees with doesn't need doesn't the need First, a First Amendment. Amendment. <laughs> and the courts have used, in, in Barnett, right. they used, you know, sort of the cantankerous person, the yep. crotchety person. Um, Great and, language. Yes. And we also talk about the thought we hate, just as Holmes said. Right. That's, that's what we're here to protect. Right. And um, so in times when there is great political and cultural conflict, the First Amendment becomes extremely important. So let's uh, dig a little deeper then into uh, this question of whether young children are being censored in this country. Yes, you asked me and we got a little we bit got, off we target, off, but that's yes. fine. Um, yes, so they have all these rights and yet in schools all across the country, there are constant um, attempts by authorities and successes by authorities in silencing speech that the authorities don't like. School principals and school boards regularly silence speech that someone might find offensive, most commonly because one parent comes in and complains and says, my kid told me that this other kid had a t-shirt on. And it, and it was offensive to us. And it crosses every cultural divide, every political divide. It is equal censorship when you look at all the school districts, not within any single school district. Mm -hmm. So they censor pro-Trump t-shirts. They censored pro-Hillary t-shirts. They censor shirts calling for support for LGBT rights and shirts condemning homosexuality and so on with abortion, with every high conflict, uh, immigrants, pro and anti. Um, and this is an absolute violation of the clearest rights. In fact, there was a censorship incident a couple of years ago at the very same high school that John Tinker attended. Oh, is that Where right? they said, they didn't know, right? And, and the child of one of the Barnett sisters who refused to salute the flags for the flag for the same reason his mother did, was sent home, and she actually had to go to the principal All and say, years later. "Don't you know about my case?" That was, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago. Yes. But still, it's remarkable. So there's some some school principals who just don't know, and they aren't taught this in education schools, and that's a problem. But there's also willful disobedience on the part of authority figures who think they're doing the right thing, and the law's wrong. 
And right. there's misunderstanding, and there I'm very sensitive because principals and teachers have to make split-second decisions right. if and, they think there's going to be These disruption. are not easy jobs, right. and they're not often easy. on the firing line and they're not trained symbolically lawyers. Symbolically and literally. They're not trained lawyers. So right. the teacher comes in and says, there's some sort of hubbub in the cafeteria. Can we shut it up? Somebody's showing a Confederate flag. Other people might be upset. What should we do? But then the schools dig in their heels. And when they, are, when they realize that the law is not behind them, instead of saying, oh, let me now call an assembly and explain to the students what their rights are and how I misunderstood their rights, they hire lawyers and they fight in court. And so what they're teaching kids every day in our public schools is, we don't really mean it about the First Amendment, right? And you don't really have speech rights. You're apply only going here. to get in trouble. It, just... it doesn't apply here. And it's just a lot of high-flown talk. It's not about you. It's, it's for the histor history books and the civics classes, if we ever still teach but civics. But the implications of that are that every, all the dialogue has to remain very safe in the middle of the road, no testing of views or behaviors or... Uh, and, and that's not very good preparation for life. It's not good preparation for life, and it's not good preparation for college. And one of the things that I'm concerned uh. about is all this focus on what's going on with free speech and the lack of a free speech culture in colleges and universities really started to get national attention just when my book came out in it's allowed. the end of, thank you, the end of 2015. And one of my concerns is, how do you expect college students to understand the norms of free speech and the legal meaning of the First Amendment? That it means you have to hear disturbing speech. You'll be exposed to it, and what you need to do is reply with more and better speech, bring analytical reasoning to bear, challenge other people's arguments. They can't know that because they didn't grow up right. experiencing it. It strikes me as an interesting parallel to what happens to many young people when they get to college and they don't know anything about alcohol. And, it's a great analogy. And alcohol, they, they sort of, many of them become very irresponsible about alcohol, as some do, although I think the number may be uh, exaggerated. Some become irresponsible about trying to suppress speech they don't agree with, that it makes them uncomfortable. Yes, I, I th the numbers you know, are, are not clear. When you look at the survey data, the most recent survey data says the vast majority of college students say that it should be okay to suppress That's very speech disturbing. that is offensive. That's very they begin disturbing. by saying, we believe in free speech. But then when they're not. asked a more specific question, you should suppress speech that might offend. Now, even if our Constitution permitted that, which it does not, who gets to decide what's offensive? Precisely. Who's the, whom, who is anybody willing to elect to the board or the committee or the panel that decides what speech is outside the acceptable parameters? And once we start doing that, aren't we in? terrible trouble because then someone else wants onto that board and someone else wants a new category of speech added. And we're in Orwellian so. territory. That's right. So, but you argue that this goes down, this is not just a high school issue, mm -hmm. that this goes down to much earlier years. And what are you, what are you getting at there? When, how are young children's free speech rights suppressed? Well, sometimes by really silly decision making. So one of my favorites is a uh, young boy, kindergartner, first grade, he was six years old, in the playground, called another student a poo-poo head. He was suspended. It went on his permanent record, whatever that means when you're in kindergarten. Kindergarten, and, I'm not so sure. Yes, I, remember, I yeah. remember that term, permanent record, yes, it's from, a ter from high school. Yes. Strikes terror, it's like going to right? follow you through your never whole life. Never going to college, right. never getting in the army. Um, so his parents sued, and um, what the trial court said, of course you have the right to say poopoo -poo head. <laughs> you know, what code does that violate right. besides the school's behavior code? And even a, sixth gr a six year old has free speech rights, but his parents didn't really understand the First Amendment. 
because the next year the mother campaigned to get the book from which he had learned that word banned, I'll bet. banned from the library. <laughs> so he wouldn't get in trouble. So again. other students wouldn't be misled. And right, right. And did she win in getting it banned from the library? No, no. The librarians are very strong anti-censorship. Librarians um, protect us from censorship. Yes, they do. They very, are a fabulous often. group. Right. Another example are elementary school students who want to talk about religion and its role in their own life, or want to hold a little prayer group or Bible study group during recess. And schools often mistakenly silence them, thinking that somehow the Establishment Clause prevents students from expressing their own religious views, which is just Hogwash for one They're frightened of, of that. They're, 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 they're frightened, frightened of litigation. And and what how someone might complain. And if you have, if one group is having a Bible study or a discussion of those things in recess, do they have to provide them for all the other groups as well? I no, they're not providing anything. The they're kids just, are just, just three kids want to get together and talk about the Bible, right. and the school says forbidden. Right. That's not constitutional These either, and that's like a form of speech. These schools sound like pretty sterile places. Yes, and you said they're bringing all the conversation to some middle, of the middle moderate ground that won't upset anybody, and they're doing that in classrooms as well, by limiting what teachers can bring in that's outside the formal curriculum. And so how do we expect citizens to grapple with really difficult and controversial yes. issues? Yes, when does the switch get flipped that suddenly people are able and, and have well, You're supposed the to wake up one right. day and right. know how to do this. Right. And so my real concern through all this has moved actually quite far afield from my original concern about kids in my first part of my career to a concern about our democracy because active citizens as Justice Breyer has called them, are the key. You need to vote, absolutely. It's, a, it's awful that only half of our people vote. But you also need to engage and to get information and know how to process information and differentiate what a Russian posted on Facebook from actual serious coverage of issues. Sure. And if you don't learn to perform that analysis in response to speech that you don't like or in putting your own speech together, y you can't really function as a sophisticated citizen. So, so do you think rather than teaching democracy, we teach patriotism and substitute patriotism for democracy? Absolutely. I think that's a lot of what's going on in some of the controversies that are going on this very week as we're speaking about the flag. Um, what is disrespectful about kneeling quietly during the national anthem? Well, that's one that is very hard to figure out because it does seem to upset certain people terribly when someone expresses, and especially when a minority person expresses that that protest. Especially, especially. And I don't, I personally don't get that, but there are clearly a lot of people who are very bothered by it. Yes, and yet I mean, another... I don't get the upset that people right. demonstrate. And over. yet, um, another way of formulating this is what so many of our wonderful young people fought and died for over the last 200 years that's right. was the right to protest, because that's what makes us so special. Absolutely. I, there is one part of this topic that we, we haven't touched on yet, and that's bullying. And to what extent, uh, if there is a suppression of speech in grammar school, high school, et cetera, uh, is that to protect children from bullying or protect them from being stigmatized with some label that might make them unhappy? And, and feel persecuted. Yes, uh, I think the adult instinct, which is a paternalistic instinct, is in many ways an understandable and a good one. But it comes into conflict with speech rights if the bullying consists only of words, which a lot of bullying does. A lot of bullying doesn't involve just, kicking, it's, it's punching, calling names. tripping, just calling somebody a name. And the Supreme Court, in a, in a case that involved um, gender discrimination, but which also involved really unpleasant touching, um, and which the school refused to do anything to protect this 12-year-old girl. Mm. Um, and that's most of the cases you read 
uh, in court decisions about bullying or cases where there was violence and the school said we wouldn't do anything about it and the parents say don't they have to and so ultimately the court said if the bullying is so pervasive that it interferes with access to education then the school has a responsibility but generally it doesn't I was looking at a very different question what can the school do does the school have a right to silence words that are hurtful in the name in of the protecting. name of protecting students so they're not punishing um, violence right but they are interfering with words on the grounds that this is going to be a better environment for everyone. And the problem but is... But the words could imply a threat of violence, could they not? Well, there is a whole doctrine called the truth threat. It's very hard to establish a truth threat, but if it's something that any listener, or depending where you live, or that listener would understand, uh, I'm going to come and kill you. That's right. a true threat. You can be punished for that. You can be silenced. But if it's, you know, you're ugly, you're a four eyes is one of the uh, things that Justice Kennedy said in the, in the case because about of... the gender harassment. We don't want to get involved, he said, in the everyday natural part of childhood where people call each other names like four eyes was his example, not because you're wearing glasses, <laughs> I'm very nearsighted. Um, you know, or you know, in my case, you're a shrimp, you're really right. short. Um, and there again, where do we draw those lines? Now, some of them are racial epithets. Sure. Some of them are you know, anti-gay things. Some of them are very, very hurtful. But there are other ways for schools to deal with that besides punishing the speaker. And the best way is to use bullying as a teaching moment, teach, not to ignore To teach it, tolerance. To teach tolerance, mutual respect, to teach um, empathy, how do people feel, and also to teach the targets and the other people in the community what they can do. The most effective thing, it's been found, is for the bystanders to interfere, interfere and say, um, wait a minute, we don't do that in our school. Right. We'll isolate the bully. We'll befriend the bullied, the victim. That's the effective way to teach people right. how to behave. To become unpopular because you're a bully. Exactly, right. that it's not approved of. You're right. not going to be elected president of the United States if you're a bully. Speaking we could imagine a world like that. I suppose that's right. Uh, speaking of popularity, has this work made you unpopular with your colleagues in any way, defending the rights of young children? Uh, people, some people were a little bit bemused initially, but no, I think people understand that this is a, a real contribution. Uh, I think the work on bullying and um, sexting, which is also, I think, protected uh, for the person who shares willingly, mm -hmm. not for the person who transmits to unintended right, audiences. Right. Um, I think, you know, some people have questions about that. And I've talked about my views of bullying uh, at conferences in Europe, where they don't have our First Amendment tradition. They right. find it harder to understand. Harder to understand. That those words could be protected. I see. But we are also the only country that doesn't, um, that has a constitution that prevents us from criminalizing hate speech. Right. Which is a related category. Sure. Sure. What are your thoughts about that? I think it's the only way to go under our First Amendment is to tradition. Hate is, no, is not is to not say to. it is immune from criminalization right. because the only way to decide what hate speech consists of is to allow the government to do that. And the unifying theme of freedom of expression is that it is beyond the government's control. Well, and of course the question comes up that came up at the beginning of our conversation, who's going to make those decisions? Yes. But then, uh, then when the speakers of hate, if we may call them that, are armed or carrying <coughs> torches and, and intimidating I'm very glad, people. And I'm very glad we got to that because I've been thinking a lot about whether recent events in Charlottesville, in Berkeley, 
other places, are game changers for my point of view and for the First Amendment's point of view? And I, the answer is not yet, because there again you're talking about conduct. The conduct of marching in a, what was a Confederate state, carrying those torches, and having announced that there are members of the Klan, that is crossing a line from symbolic speech to conduct. In fact, Virginia has laws against right. walking with burning with, flames. Right. Um, which violent, the police didn't seem which to did know not want, they could enforce. Which did not either didn't know or didn't want to enforce. Those laws should be strictly enforced, just as universities ought to strictly discipline people who move from speech to conduct in a violent way. So very, carrying very guns. Hard issues of de well, carrying guns, of course, is another matter, but. They're exercising Second Amendment rights when they carry those guns. So. But we shouldn't be looking at these in isolation. We have to really consider the interaction. Right. Well, you're going to be very busy in this time ahead with these issues. Well, it's, it's good and important work. I wish I wasn't so busy. Thank but I'm very glad to have a chance to talk to you about them. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've been discussing the First Amendment rights of children, of elementary, middle, and high school students with Catherine J. Ross, a professor at George Washington University School of Law. To learn more about Georgetown University's Free Speech Project, visit our website. Thank you for watching.